morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Is everyone here? I believe so. Good morning. We're here to resume the um, hearing for the motion for a new trial in the case of the state of Georgia versus Justin Moss Harris. It appears to me that all parties are present and the defendant is here as well and the witness is available as well. Um, this hearing is being held in an open courtroom consistent with requirements of the Georgia Constitution and the Constitution of the United States and the appurtenant laws. There is a deputy in court. The courtroom is open. The clerks are here. Uh, the remainder of the hearing is being held via Zoom, and that is consistent with the uh, judicial emergency declared by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the State of Georgia in light of the COVID pandemic. Uh, present on Zoom uh, is the defendant, defense counsel, and uh, district attorney's representation. Excuse me, everybody. I didn't do it and shame on me. So you all also put everything on mute, mute, whatever, mute is the proper term. All right, I think we're ready to resume. Is the defense ready to go? Well, you know, okay. I'll ask, uh, that's a little opposite, but anyway. Mr. Durham, are you ready to go forward? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Dunkowski, I'm so sorry. Are you ready to go forward? Yes, Your Honor, pending sequestration of Mr. Lumpkin and Mr. Rodriguez. All right, those, were, those people need to be sequestered. I believe you're in the midst of your cross-examination. Would you like to resume at this time? Yes, I would. Would you please? Thank you. Mr. Kilgore, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right, so um, when did Dr. Diamond give you defense one and defense two? Hold on one moment. I may be able to locate something conclusive to that. Hang on just a sec. I apologize. I um, I cannot tell you with any certainty. I, I just can't tell you with any certainty. It was sometime uh, after. Uh, it, it apparently was sometime after April of 2016. Okay, and you testified that you didn't really recall the substance of the August 19th, 2016 motion hearing on the state's motion to compel. Is that right? The August 19th, 2016, the first motion to compel motion hearing. I have not reviewed that. Okay. Um, but this trial court did grant the state's motion to compel on August 29th, 2016. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And September 6th comes, and I believe the defense filed defendant's motion number 26, which was a motion to reconsider the motion to compel. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And at the same time, the state also filed the second motion to compel. Is that correct? Uh, they, yes. All right. And so I'm going to share my screen. Are you able to see defendant's motion 26 there? Yes. All right. And filed September 6, 2016. Is that correct? Yes. All right. 
And in this motion, right here on paragraph one, it actually acknowledged that the state is seeking to compel any statement that your client, Justin Ross Harris, purportedly made to Dr. David Diamond. And you understood that that's what the state was looking for. That's, uh, that's what I have asserted in paragraph one. And in addition, when we go down here to paragraph eight, okay, you'd agree that paragraph eight reads, however, this court's order can be fairly characterized to require the disclosure of far more than the statute requires, including work product, outlines, notes, thoughts, questions, and strategy, or any interpretation of a conversation with the defendant is re referenced therein. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And did you include this paragraph because you'd had the three pages of notes, D1, from Dr. Diamond? Uh, I included that paragraph because it was obvious from the court's order that uh, it far ex uh, the, the order, in my opinion, far exceeded what the statute would require or the statutes the court was relying on would require. But you understood that the only thing the state wanted was Dr. Diamond. Dr. Diamond is relying on the statements of Ross Harris to form his opinion. So the state only wants the statements Ross Harris gave to Dr. Diamond upon which he's relying to form his opinion. Correct? It doesn't matter what the state wants. What, what matters is what the court ordered. And the, court or, the court's order was very broad. The document that was turned over, the three-page type document, uh, fit the absolutely fit the uh, criteria of what the court was requiring that we turn over, because that document, although it was confidential work product and included conversations between counsel and the expert, it also included um, uh, responses that. Uh, Ross Harris had given to the expert uh, because he had used the document as sort of a go by when he went and talked to Ross Harris. So um, uh, not split hairs, but uh, I mean, I don't I don't just do what the state asked for. I was doing what the court ordered. Okay. I was turning over what the court ordered, regardless of what the state asked for. We were turning over what the court ordered us to. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look then um, at the second motion to compel hearing. You'd agree that that took place uh, late Friday afternoon on the fifth day of trial on September 16th. Is that your recollection? Uh, what was the date again? September 16th, 2016. It's volume five of the transcript. So the fifth day of trial, which was the fifth day of jury selection late in the evening on Friday. Do you recall that? That's right. All right. So I'm going to now share with you up here. We have come up. Well, I'm going to go ahead and let's see where I'm at. 296. I'm going to go up here and I'm going to show you. So this is September 16th, volume five of 35. Is that correct? What I'm showing you here? Right. Okay. And so if we go down to I think right. page, I'm going to pull this 1332. On the top of page 1332, we have Mr. Boring beginning his argument after you've made your argument to the court. Is that your recollection? Right. So when we go down here to the bottom of this page, do you recall Mr. Boring stating, I will note that the state is pursuing this under 17.16.4, not as a statement of the defendant, but as a statement of Dr. Diamond, his statement about and his recording documentation of his conversations with the defendant 
That's flat out what we're looking for. Do you remember that? Uh, uh, yes. Judge, uh, excuse me, I'm gonna object to the form of the question. Now she can ask him if that's what was said, but as far as asking him, that's flat out what that they are looking for, that goes beyond his um, knowledge or now he's gonna speculate what the state has said and um, or what the state's thinking. This is the state. I'm not asking Mr. Kilgore to speculate as to what the state wanted. The state says right here what they wanted. I just want to understand Mr. Kilgore's understanding. Well, uh, sorry. I'm phrasing this badly, Judge. I want to make sure Mr. Kilgore, I want to, Mr. Kilgore's recollection of this motion hearing was brought up on direct. So I'm trying to go through it so that we're all on the same footing as to what happened during the second motion to compel. She has him on cross-examination and I don't find the question to be outside of the realm of that. And so you can proceed. Maybe um, just go ahead. Thank you, Judge. Uh, I'll try and ask a better question. So, um, I, let, me, let me answer your question to the best of my ability. Um, I understand what the state was arguing. I understand what is on that paper, um, but it was certainly our belief all along that uh, what they what the state were, was really wanting were the words of Ross Harris. Under the statute, the defendant is not a witness. So they were not entitled to the words of Ross Harris, the recorded statement of the defendant. So they were using Dr. Diamond basically as a straw man to get to the words of Ross Harris. That's what the state was after. We understood that very clearly. That's what they wanted. Um, uh, it's my opinion that this was um, uh, a mechanism whereby they misled the court as to uh, what it was they were trying to get at. So, Mr. Kilgore, in your experience, have you ever had a, an expert witness base their opinion on an interview with one of your clients, such as in a competency or insanity case, where the basis of their opinion is solely upon the words of the defendant. And therefore the state is actually entitled to know what it is the basis is. And if the basis is the words of the defendant, they're entitled to that information, correct? Um, you're, you're mixing up apples and oranges. There is an entirely different code section, uh, entirely different part of the statute that deals with uh, the what is discoverable for an expert witness uh, in a mental health case. That is a different part of the statute. That, statu that part of the statute is not uh, applicable here. This was not a mental health case. This was not a mental health witness who was um, uh, uh, offering an opinion based on um, uh, a mental health evaluation of the defendant. So I, I think you're talking apples and oranges, but the, but to the extent that any expert bases his opinion on information that um, came from interviewing whoever, including the defendant. Well, that would be discoverable on cross-examination at trial. That, that, that is a rule of evidence. And, and, and that is uh, something for cross-examination. That, that is not a mechanism to get uh, uh, notes um, of an expert in advance as part of discovery. So upon cross-examination of Dr. Diamond at trial, if he had been put on the stand, the state would have been able to ask him, what did Ross Harris specifically tell you about this? And he would have repeated that. Is that correct? Yes, they would have been able to. Uh, well, let, let me clarify that. Let me clarify that. Uh, the state, I believe, filed a motion um, they either, I, I believe they may have filed a motion um, to preclude the, uh, the witness for, uh, witnesses from getting, um, uh, from allowing Ross Harris to testify through the words of the expert. In other words, Ross, uh, Ross Harris getting his story out um, without having to take the stand, simply putting an expert on to pair it back what Ross had told him. Uh, my recollection is the state had filed something or uh, made some objection to that if, if, if that was coming. I don't, have, I don't have that motion in front of me. Um, uh, 
but to the extent that uh, an expert takes the stand and offers an opinion, and that opinion in any way was based on conversations with Ross, they would be able to question him on cross-examination about that. Um, what I do not believe they are entitled to do is to have those notes as they go by, uh, those notes meaning the confidential work product that we had to turn over. I don't believe they were entitled to have that as a go by to, uh, to question the witness with. Um, and uh, I, I will tell you very directly that um, we do not allow uh, witness uh, expert witnesses to take notes to the stand. There is no way we would have ever permitted Diamond to take those notes to the stand. And if you look back at the testimony of Dr. Gene Brewer, that's very clear, uh, clearly stated in his testimony. Uh, he said, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't have my notes up here. I, I, don't, I don't have any notes. That's because we made it real clear you can't take your notes to the stand. And that was part of your strategy to not have your experts take the notes to the stand. That's part of any and every case I, I, I've ever tried. We, we don't let uh, experts take notes up there that the state could then grab and uh, use to whatever advantage they want. That's, um, I mean, that's kind of like law school 101. But in this case, the state already knew about the notes, Dr. Diamond having told Mr. Boring on April 6, 2016, that the notes existed. And in the paragraph of the summary of his testimony, it said he was basing his testimony on the conversation he'd had with Ross Harris, correct? I don't, I, I don't recall, but um, I, I think that um, the expert, uh, uh, we, we certainly advised him that you can talk to the district attorney and be truthful with him. And it's my belief that that's exactly what happened. Um, I do not believe there is any evidence that David Diamond told the uh, state of Georgia, I have six pages of notes and this is this is what is on there. I'm not going to give it to you. I, I don't believe he told them that, but he would have told them, well, yeah, I, I spoke to Ross Harris. We had a conversation. Certainly that certainly that has a bearing on what my opinions are in this case. So what we have here going back to volume Five of the trial transcript where we're in our second motion to compel, you'll notice here that Mr. Boring is once again stating here at line seven and line eight on page 1333 that referring to Dr. Diamond, he has said that he's relying on his conversation with the defendant in his summary. You'd agree that that's one of the arguments made by the state. Um, what line are you talking about, please? I'm right here on the screen share, line seven and eight. He has said he is relying on his conversation with the defendant in his summary, referring to Dr. Diamond. He made that assertion. Okay. And we go down. Mr. Boring, again, at the bottom here on line 24 and 25 says that, which I think it's strange credibility to say that that's not a statement of Dr. Diamond about his conversation about the, and we go down the next page, line one, defendant's conversation with him, which he relies on. Is that the argument Mr. Boring was making that he wanted Dr. Diamond's notes about his conversation with the defendant because he's going to rely on those notes. Um, so I, I will continue to answer that uh, the same way that I did. Um, what the state wanted were the words of Ross Harris. They were not entitled to it. And so they used this motion, this argument to make David Diamond a, the straw man to get to any words of Ross Harris. Okay, so... Going on then, we have on the next page on 1335, we have the court at line three, basically saying that the ruling in August was, in my opinion, the correct ruling, and she hasn't heard anything that changed her opinion, and therefore she denied the defendant's motion to reconsider. Is that the gist of that paragraph by the court? That's what it says. All right. Now, 
out of an abundance of caution by Mr. Boring, you'd agree because you mentioned it on direct examination that Mr. Boring actually said, we don't want attorney work product. In fact, he says that right here on line 13, we're not looking for work product of the defense attorneys or anything like that. So we don't have a problem with them redacting things and things of that nature. We don't want to step over that route. I think it's clear what we're looking for. So he actually said, redact away. We just want the thing we're asking for, which is the statements of Ross Harris that were given to Dr. Diamond that Dr. Diamond's going to rely upon for his opinion. And that's what he said. He said, please redact, right? Um, uh, yeah, that is what he said. Uh, I think it's pretty clear at that juncture, the state realized, uh, uh, we believe the state realized that they had stepped in it and the court was ordering um, something to be turned over that really should not have been required to be turned over. That's how, that's how we read that exchange. Okay. And he then went on to say, if there is an issue and the defense has an issue, I have no problem with them redacting it and we can take it up later. Is that what Mr. Boring told the court? That is what he said. Okay. And then the next page, Mr. Boring continues. So I'm at the bottom of 1335 the top of 1336. And his concern was, well, judge, I know they put in there about attorney work product. I'm assuming, and I, you correct me if I'm wrong, that he's referring to the motion that we previously looked at, your motion to compel your paragraph eight, correct? I, I'm not going to get into what he, what his mind was there because that I truly don't know. I assume that he was talking about our motion. Okay. And he then says, I don't want there to be any attorney work product that they think are somehow, if they're going to turn it over and say that this ordered attorney work product. And the court then said, I stand by what I just said, all of it. Okay. So when the court says, I stand by what I said, all of it, you only needed to turn over the statements of Ross Harris that Dr. Diamond was going to rely upon, correct? No. And you... We needed to turn over what the court ordered, all of it. The document that was turned over um, was, as I testified yesterday, was not compiled in a single setting. It was a compilation of uh, sitting down with the attorneys uh, and... Um, uh, Dr. Diamond took that apparently into the interview room and then added to it with either responses of Ross Harris or his own uh, thoughts or opinions about something that Ross had said. Um, so that document clearly, without question, fell within the all of it that the court's uh, original order to compel uh, contained. The order was very broad. And the court was very clear. She did not stutter. She, she did not make it conditional in any way. She said all of it. And so we complied with the court order. She was already frustrated that we had not turned it over earlier. And so we turned over what the court ordered, all of it. So when the court says, I stand by what I just said, all of it, you didn't take that to being, she stands by what she said, all of what she said, meaning in my previous order, I'm standing by that. I, I, knew, exactly, I knew exactly what the court meant. She meant all of it. All of it in, uh, relating back to the original order, which again um, was very expansive. And uh, give me a moment. Are you currently seeing the order on state's motion to compel, Mr. Kilgore? Yes. And right here in the middle of the state's order, it says, further as defendant intends to call Dr. Diamond as an expert witness, Dr. Diamond will be required to disclose any and all of these statements and writings on cross-examination by the state. 
And the court finds that pretrial disclosure, meaning the statements and writings, is required or is necessary, I said, I apologize, is necessary to allow the state an opportunity for meaningful cross-examination. And basically what she says up above here finds that any and all statements and writings memorialized in any manner regarding Diamond's conversations, interviews, and discussions with defendant in this case are discoverable. And based on this order, is it correct that you handed over defense one and defense two to the state? Yes. And directing your attention to September 19th of 2016, is that the day that you did comply with the motion and gave the state defense one and defense two? If that was the following Monday, then yes. Right. And do you recall on the morning of October 4th, right before opening statements in this case, um, that the state went on the record confirming that they'd received it, but out of an abundance of caution, had not looked at the handwritten notes, but in fact had looked at D1 and were going to go ahead and review D1. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I remember thinking that it was ridiculous that the state did its own in-camera inspection by itself. If it was worried that there was something it shouldn't see in there, uh, it certainly could have asked the court to do an in-camera inspection and it did not. And at no point in time, did you ask the court to do an in-camera inspection on D1 and D2? No, instead I, I filed a motions uh, to reconsider um, and made a strenuous argument uh, against turning over these documents. You'd agree with me that at absolutely no time on August 29th or um, during the second motion to compel on September 16th, did you tell the court or anyone that you considered these notes to be, as you said, confidential work product notes between the defense attorneys and the expert? I don't, I don't recall how I pled it. Um, I, I don't recall how I pled it. You talking about in the pleading? No, I'm talking during your oral argument, when you're in front of the judge during the second motion to compel, not once did you assert or state that what you were being forced to hand over that you considered it to be attorney work product. You'd agree I, with I, that? I think it was in the pleading. During the, during the argument, I was making legal argument, which I stand by that it, 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 it shouldn't have had to be turned over legally uh, within the statutes that the court had, was citing or that the state was arguing. Okay. What I'm asking you is, you'd agree with me that you never orally, verbally told the court what that you considered this document, D1 and D2, these documents to be confidential work product notes between the defense attorneys and the expert. I, I may not have argued it orally while I was making my legal argument. All right. But, so but, but Ms. Dunkowski, no, let me, let me, let me, uh, let, let me I'm, point I'm sorry, out Judge, that. I apologize, Your Honor. I'm, I'm really going to object. I'm I agree. I agree. And the reason I'm objecting is I'm just trying to ask Mr. Kilgore certain questions and, and Mr. Kilgore has a tendency for soliloquy. Um, and I would just ask for some direction from the court, um, especially since he seems to want to just volunteer information without a question being posed to him. You just need to interrupt him and I'll say yay or nay. Um, Thank you, Judge. But you do, cross-examination elicits more of an answer than a direct act. Well, that's not exactly the case. I would say craft your questions carefully if you consider that to be a problem. That would be what I would say. Thank you, Judge. I will. Yes, ma'am. All right. So, Mr. Kilgore, Dr. Diamond was not prevented from testifying via an exclusion or some ruling of the court. Is that correct? Right. And you could have put him on the stand to testify. Is that correct? He was available to testify. All right. So directing your attention now to November 3rd of 2016. Um, do you recall that as the date that Dr. Brewer uh, testified, uh, the 29th day of trial? I don't remember specifically what day it was, but it was toward the end of the trial. All right. 
and who conducted the uh, direct examination of Dr. Gene Brewer? I did. And he was on the stand all of the morning, wasn't he? Um, I mean, he testified probably half a day or close to half a day. All right. So if the trial transcript reflected that his testimony was over at 1148, do you feel that's accurate? It, it, I don't have any reason to doubt the transcript. Okay. And do you recall at that time asking the court if you could have a break in order to discuss with the other lawyers and the witness whether or not you were going to put him up on the stand? Right. Right. And then a recess was taken from approximately 1157 to about 110. Do you recall that? I'm sorry, I have a question. You said him. So Dr. Burr has been on the witness stand. He comes off at 1148 or so. Defense asks for a recess to review whether they're going to put him on the witness stand. Who is them? Very good question. Mr. Kilgore, who's him? D uh, David Diamond. All right, that's what I thought. I just want to be sure. Thank you, Your Honor, for helping me with that and clear that up. Um, so the recess was taken from 11.57 to 1.10 p.m., is that correct? Uh, uh, I have no reason to doubt the transcript there. Okay. And where was Dr. David Diamond at the time Dr. Gene Brewer was testifying? You know, I've thought about that, and I absolutely cannot remember. I, I, I just cannot remember. I, I, I want to say he was. I want to say he was in the courthouse, but I, I just, I really, I can't remember. To the best of your recollection, did you then meet with Dr. Diamond at lunchtime? I cannot remember. I cannot remember. Uh, um, I just can't. Okay. So during that hour lunch, did you meet with Mr. Rodriguez and Mr. Lumpkin to discuss putting Dr. Diamond on the stand? Um, well, we absolutely, uh, that would have been something that we discussed because that's, that's, um, uh, obviously the, the, the time that I pulled the trigger. So, um, um, I, I can't remember where we were, but, I, uh, or any specific conversation, but we absolutely would have, would have talked about it. Because my next question was going to be, what did you guys talk about specifically? But you're saying you don't have a recollection of the specific discussion with Mr. Lumpkin and Mr. Rodriguez about the pros and cons of. Well, sure. There had there had been um, I mean, from the time we had to turn those uh, those notes over, there had been conversations with them um, about um, the ability to now. Uh, use Dr. Diamond. And um, uh, at the end of the day, it was, um, I was the one that was going to have to to pull the trigger. Um, and so uh, I certainly ran things by, by both of them. Um, but specifically what we talked about four years ago during a lunch break, I, I couldn't tell you at this date. Okay. So after running it by Mr. Rodriguez and Mr. Lumpkin, what was your decision? We did not put uh, we did not put him on the stand. And all right. Um, now, once you decided not to put. Dr. David Diamond on the stand. I think you let him know that he was not going to testify. Do you recall that conversation with him? I, I do not recall a conversation in the courthouse. Um, it's, it's my belief that we I had told him the day before that he was not going to be called. Um, that's, that's my recollection. Okay. That I had told him the night before that he was not going to be called as a witness. But he was present in the courthouse um, on 
the on November, let me make sure I have the day right, November 3rd, 2016, in anticipation of him being the witness called that afternoon, correct? No, I would disagree with your assertion there. Um, he, he was in Glenn County. We had brought him up from Tampa and he was there. Uh, we continued to prep him as if he were going to testify. Um, you know, uh, trials are fluid and, and you, you don't know what's going to happen from one witness to the next, from one question to the next. So until you actually pull the trigger and make a decision, either calling a witness or not calling them, you, you continue to keep all of your options open. Okay. So I just want to make sure. On November 3rd, you put Dr. Brewer on the stand. You then made your decision, as you call it, pulled the trigger over lunch, and then you told the court, I don't have any other witnesses for this afternoon. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. And so Dr. Diamond, though, was prepared and was in the courthouse on November 3rd in case you decided to put him up on the stand that afternoon. To the, to the best of my recollection, he was, he was probably at the courthouse that day. To the best of my recollection, I had told him the night before he would not be testifying. Okay. And why did and what were the reasons you gave him for why he would not be testifying? Well, I gave him um, lots of reasons. Um, included, uh, obviously, was the fact that his notes had to be <laughs> his notes had to be turned over. Um, that the the court had. Uh, ruled against us on um, our uh, subpoena to uh, obtain FBI files that uh, were in the possession of the uh, police department and the uh, Cobb County DA's office. Uh, that the court had um, uh, ruled against us in uh, several evidentiary rulings and we were not confident that uh, the court was going to uh, rule with us if the state objected to any parts of his testimony. Um, that um, uh, that the state's case had been lousy. Um, I mean, there, there were there were lots of things that we talked about with him. I mean, he he is a he is a, an, uh, you know, an esteemed professor and uh, an, uh, the expert of experts in this field, but um, in, a professional, in a professional relationship that we had, um, I certainly wanted to let him down easy. And, and I think the best way to let him down easy was to give him as many reasons as possible why, why um, you know, we had decided that it was not a good idea for him to for him to testify. Uh, it was not his decision; it was mine. And um, uh, I, all I can tell you is that, regardless of whatever conversations we had with him, or even amongst the lawyers, at the end of the day, my decision not to call him was based on the fact the court required us to turn those notes over. Right, so moving on now to the issue uh, regarding Detective Sean Murphy and the search warrant testimony. Um, oh, however, I, I did miss one thing I wanted to ask you about with the PowerPoint. The 50 slide PowerPoint that Dr. Diamond had developed that he was anticipating testifying to, do you remember when you received that from him? I could not give you a specific date from memory. All right. And you do recall though, despite there being no certificate of service uh, in the file, you remember sending it over to the state or giving the state a copy? 
Yeah, it was a demonstrative aid. We would not have done a certificate of service because it was not going to be a piece of substantive evidence. Um, and the state knew about it already. Um, I think we had, uh, I think maybe the original PowerPoint, we may have put on a discovery, um, uh, a discovery sheet that was included with some other materials, but the, the last, the, um, the final PowerPoint, we didn't do a discovery filing for it, uh, but we absolutely gave it to uh, prosecutor uh, Chuck Boring. And do you recall, um, I think you already testified, I just wanna make sure that, that Chuck told you, Mr. Boring told you that he did have some objections to some of the slides. Yes. Thank you. All right, so when we talk, I am gonna actually transition now. When we talk about um, calling Detective Sean Murphy, um, the state didn't call Detective Murphy in its case in chief, is that correct? They did not. All right, and the state did though call Detective Phil Stoddard as he was the lead detective. That is correct. All right, he was on the stand about four days. Is that right? But I, I don't remember, it was several days. And you attacked him quite um, efficiently in your opening statement, talking about how you questioned his credibility. Is that right? Credibility was uh, central to our defense. And so that's why we covered it uh, so um, thoroughly in opening. All right. And do you recall your opening statement was on October 5th of 2016? That sounds about right. Right. And then closing arguments, you also brought up these points again to reinforce them as part of your strategic theory of the case. Uh, that's partially true. I brought up those things which we were allowed to uh, go into during the trial of the case. During closing, I, I did not go into the um, search, the lies that were uh, uh, given to the magistrate to obtain the search warrant because we were not allowed to, we were not allowed to uh, bring that evidence before the jury. Well, what I was asking Mr. Kilgore was regarding Detective Phil Stoddard. Talked about him in opening, and you also talked about him specifically in closing. Yes. Okay, and your closing argument that was November seventh, November seventh of twenty sixteen. That sounds about right. And as part of your strategy during your opening statement, um, you played actually three video clips of Ross Harris's statement, didn't you? Yes. And I, 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 I found seven different times where you talked about Detective Stoddard and asserted that he lied under oath. Does that sound about right to you for your opening statement? I, I don't, I, I don't know how many times, but he did lie. And so we did bring it out in opening. And you cross-examined Detective Stoddard about all those issues. Is that correct? To the best of my recollection, we, we covered, we, we, we covered uh, all of those credibility issues with Detective Stoddard. And in fact, you did try and bring up you tried to question Detective Stoddard about what Detective Murphy had said to the magistrate judge when applying for the search warrants, right? Yes. All right. And the state objected to that, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now. There we go. So taking a look here at volume 22 on October 25th of 2016. Can you see that, Mr. Cooper? Yes. All right, so do you recall this bench conference? I do. All right. And this is where Mr. Boring is objecting to the hearsay, is that correct? Yes. All right, and his objections was, is it were, his objections were about going into the contents of the search warrant, the search warrant affidavit, all which were not done by Detective Stoddard. 
He then told the court he had some case law on that. And then he said, B, it's hearsay if it is a statement of other people, not this detective. And he reiterated, there's no lead detective exception to the hearsay rule. Is that fair? Yes. And then he said, the defense can call Detective Murphy. And then if it's relevant, it cannot be hearsay. Is that what Mr. Boring said? Yes. And is that when you made your decision to call uh, Detective Murphy? Yes. And I believe it was actually Mr. Lumpkin who did the cross-examination of Mr. Murphy or Detective Murphy, is that correct? Yes. If I may have one moment, Your Honor, to see if there's anything else. If I may have one more moment, Your Honor. I'll pass the witness. Thank you, Your Honor. We direct Mr. Durham. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Kugel, how are you today? Good morning. Okay, let's um Kind of, uh, I was going to say, um, just go back from yesterday and work our way uh, forward now. And um, uh, yesterday, uh, you gave a uh, testimony, and um, the state asked you about your opening statement. Do you recall that? Yes. And um, you were asked about Dr. Diamond. Uh, well, actually, you were asked if you, if you um, included Dr. Diamond in your opening statement. Yes. And uh, was, was, his name was not mentioned in your opening statement, was it? No. And um, you just mentioned an expert. Yes. Okay. Had you been ordered um, and already turned over the notes that Dr. Diamond um, uh, and uh, his work product and uh, the guideline by opening? Hold on, please. Where is it? Mr. Durham, I'm, I'm going to need some help there. I, um... All right, well, let me, let me ask this if I can. Um, do you recall your, uh, uh, in open, when you gave your opening statement, um, do you remember when you did that? Yes, uh, that was, um, I apologize. Give me, give me one moment. I've got the transcript here. Let me see if I can find that, please. Yeah, the opening statement wasn't given until volume 10. And I, I believe that the um, notes would have been turned over several days earlier because I believe that matter was discussed in volume five. And um, do you recall when, um, um, right before you gave opening, uh, was that when Mr. Boring uh, informed the court about uh, their, um, I'll use the air quotes, in-camera inspection? and sealed a portion of the notes in an envelope. That, that timing sounds about right. And that would have been in sometime in October. That would have been October the 3rd. Okay. And 
uh, did you file your disclosure uh, sometime in the middle of September? I think September 16th or 19th. Do you recall That's that? right. Yeah. Would that have any bearing on why Dr. Dinah's name wasn't in that opening? Um, I don't have any specific recollection, Mr. Durham. Um, I just don't have any specific recollection. Um, if okay. that had any bearing or not, um, I, I, uh, so I guess my answer is, uh, it certainly, it certainly could have, but I just don't, uh, I, I don't recall whether that factored in or not, sir. All right. Um, you were asked about, um, Dr. Diamond's potential testimony, um, and about, uh, the, uh, state could have been, um, objecting to the portions of the PowerPoint. And do you recall that question? Yes. Now, um, do you also recall uh, in the conversations uh, with the state about um, when Mr. Boring announced to the, the, the court that y'all had provided the transcripts, or excuse me, the PowerPoint to them, they had some objections and y'all would just resolve the issues uh, at a break, you remember? Right. That? Yes. Is that, have, uh, and is that what y'all are doing? Is working together and trying to resolve the issues before you went to court and um, uh, try to make the trial run smoothly? Yes. Now, the summary that you provided um, back in April uh, in 2016. That, that summary um, was before the motion hearings. Do you recall that, if that was? Uh, before which motion hearings? Well, the motion hearing to, um, the motion to compel, the motion for ultimate issue, and the motion. Yes, to... yes. Yeah. And so uh, your summary was done before uh, the uh, court made the ruling that Dr. Diamond couldn't testify to the ultimate issue of the case. True, that's true. And your um, cross-examination or your attempted cross-examination of um, Detective Stoddard, did, um, did there have been any benefit? Uh, you stated yesterday that part of it, if I recall, you know, of, of some of the reasons why you wanted to um, cross-examine him and why he thought that he should be, you should be allowed to, but uh, would there have been any benefit to find out where the false um, information that Detective Murphy provided to the magistrate? Would there have been any benefit to y'all uh, in, in your theory of defense? Of course, absolutely. Uh, as far as the source of it? Absolutely. Tell us how. Well, uh, we know that uh, Detective Murphy gave false uh, testimony to the magistrate under oath. Uh, of course, the state's uh, states claiming that, well, um, you know, he was just parroting something else that he had heard. So it, it couldn't be a lie because he was just testifying about something somebody else told him. Well, uh, we know that he, he gave that false testimony to the magistrate uh, immediately following Detective Stoddard's interview with uh, Ross Harris. So, uh, I mean, more than likely, one of two things happened. Either Murphy listened in on that interview or Jack Stoddard came. Calls for speculation as to what took place. Judge, I think he is, if I can respond, I think he's allowed, he's uh, explaining what his strategies are and what the decisions he made at trial. And uh, I think this is part of it, is how they were deciding to proceed. He didn't couch it as such. He's, he's speaking as if it's fact, and it would be speculative, and I sustain the objection. And as far as the... Uh, I'll, I'll try not to speculate. Um, what were you thinking? Well, what were your concerns? Our, our concerns were that if uh, Murphy was uh, not knowingly lying to the magistrate, then... Um, some other detective had given him false information 
either way, uh, it's the uh, it's the police department. It, it, it is the detectives that are um, uh, lying about what was said in that interview room in order to further their narrative. And, and in that particular instance, in order to obtain a search warrant. And um, you'd mentioned something about the timing of the search warrants in your investigation of the case, the timing of the search warrants as to when the uh, interview uh, in custody interview of Ross Harris was. Um, try, does that tie into this? Absolutely. And uh, you know, explain how. Well, we know that uh, some of the search warrants were uh, requested immediately, uh, immediately following the interview with Ross Harris, and they contained references to the interview with Ross Harris. Those references, um, those references contained uh, statements which were false. Uh, they said that that Ross Harris had stated or Ross Harris had said certain things that, in fact, he had not said and he had not stated. They were attributing um, uh, false statements to him, which were very nefarious and damning, but untrue. And, um, and that would uh, help um, uh, in furtherance of uh, your theory of defense? Yes. Did you find that? Okay. Now let's go back over the um, Dr. Diamond, uh, the motion to compel. Now, in, in his interviews, do you recall when um, the second interview, that would be the one with the typewritten notes uh, from your testimony yesterday, do you recall when that it would have occurred? So, uh, Mr. Durham, I, I looked through my files yesterday, which are numerous boxes, and what I discovered was a notation that there was a, a, a lengthy interview on August the 10th, 2015. I, my notes indicate it was three and a half hours. It, in trying to reconstruct this, it's, it is my opinion that that is very likely the first meeting where we went to the jail with David Diamond. Um, so I, I think that my characterization as a meet and greet was probably uh, not entirely accurate. Uh, according to my notes, it was a very lengthy meeting. I then looked to see if I could verify when the second meeting was with David Diamond and Ross Harris, and I simply could, could not verify it. I, I, I couldn't find anything to verify the exact date of the second meeting. Now, do you recall uh, looking at the um, typewritten guideline uh, that um, off of um, Dr. Diamond's laptop? Yes. And do you, I mean, does, does the date of uh, April 30th ring a bell, 2016? I, 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 see the, I see the date on the document but I didn't type it and I, I could not, I couldn't tell you why that date is on there or okay. what significance it is. All right. Um, do you know as far as uh, <clears throat> your recollection, would the motion to compel that Chuck Boring filed seeking the notes in his conversations with Dr. Diamond, would that have been before that April 30th date? No, I, I believe that he filed that motion after, after April the 30th. I don't, I don't have the filing date in front of me, but I, I believe he filed it after that date. Seems like he maybe filed it and I, I don't, it was after that date, surely. Um, now let me just, if, but if, if I told you uh, this, uh, there was a, a filing date of April 11th, would that ring a bell?
Do you have the document I could look at? I'm trying to figure out a way to get you to look at it. <laughs> Would it assist so, you if I put it up? I'll yeah, I, I've got a I've got a file. If you could give me one moment, let me see if I can find it. All right, that's on the screen. Thank you, Mr. Tomkowski. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Can you pull it down where I can see the rest of it, please? Of course. Okay. 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 So I, I guess, Mr. Durham, uh, I, I, I guess let me um, let me answer that question again. Um, it, it certainly appears, it certainly appears that, um, the state had filed the motion to compel prior to that, um, prior to that date on the document, um, uh, April the 30th. Okay. And, uh, let me ask you this, uh, uh, would it appear then that the conversations Mr. Boring had with Dr. Diamond that were the basis of the motion to compel would have been dealing with the handwritten notes as opposed to the typewritten uh, guideline? I, I, don't, I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't answer that because I don't know when they were prepared. Okay, all right, all right. But you would agree if, um, the April 30th was the prepared date, then the typewritten notes could not have been um, what they were referring to if they were not created before um, April 11th. That would be true. Now, you mentioned there's a three and a half hour meeting, that first meeting with Dr. Diamond. My notes, my notes reflect that occurred on August the 10th, 2015. Um, that's what my notes reflect. Okay. But I mean, my, my question is more around the time frame. You said it was three and a half hours. So you're, uh, that's, again, more than a meet and greet. And that was the one with uh, several people involved. Is that your recollection? Uh, my notes say that it was a meeting with the expert David Diamond and Ross Harris at the jail. Now let's go back to the uh, motion to compel. The um, state had asked you about some, some questions about um, what Chuck Boring um, had uh, told the court. Now. Uh, and he did, uh, and you read on um, the uh, transcript that he mentioned about the possibility of redaction and offered offered that to the court. Do you recall that? Um, yes, sir, he did, because that's what was in my pleading. So my question is, so, uh, you were asked if you um, made any reference to it in your argument. Um, was there, did you find a need to, or was it argue, was it, was the, uh, issue already out there on the table? Uh, I pled the argument in my pleading, the, the, uh, argument I made orally in court appears to be m more legal in nature. Um, Mr. Boring apparently took up the mantle, uh, for redaction or for, um, uh, the, the fact that uh, we had pled, we had asserted that there was some privilege, uh, some uh, uh, attorney work product or confidential work product in there, uh, and the the court was not uh, apparently. The court said all of it. Okay, so you brought it up in a pleading, specifically stating work product. Is that your testimony? Yes. And at the hearing. Um, it was brought up again in front of the court. Is that correct? Is that what yes. You're okay. Now, um, do you recall the uh, when when they were talking about um, all of it? Um, and your statement was that you believe she meant everything. 
I, I believe what she meant was it referred back to the original order on the motion to compel, which was worded very, very broadly. And, and I, in, in my pleading in the motion for reconsideration, I, I believe I, I touched on that, that it was, it was, it swept up a lot of stuff. Do you recall when uh, Mr. Boring uh, mentioned the um, possibility about re redaction and uh, the, the, the judge said, well, you invited that? Do you recall that statement about the judge? Yes, yes. And there, was that right before she said, I stand by it? All yes. It? Okay. After that, did... Um, Mr. Boring ever make a uh, offer to you to consent to uh, allow you to redact it? No. Did he ever say, well, why don't we just have the judge do it in camera? No. Now, the, uh, your recollection on the day that they came back in and said they had somebody look at it, um, your recollection is they provided the um, handwritten copies to the court is something they were not going to look at. Is that correct? That sounds right. What was your bigger concern uh, out of those two um, sets of papers? Obviously the handwritten notes, the handwritten notes is all I was worried about because those were, <laughs> because in addition to the statements uh, from of Ross Harris on there, the, the bulk of it were uh, reflecting uh, attorney work product, which was, you know, conversations between us and David Diamond. All right, um, but now which, which ones, uh, we've gone over yesterday with D1, and that, uh, do you recall that? Is D, was D1 the handwritten notes? Judge, if I could ask the clerk to put up a D1, please. Uh, Ms. Kilgore, there's D1 right there uh, in fr front of you. has been marked for D1 admitted. Is that um, the one you were concerned about? Yes, sir. Okay. And the other three handwritten pages, do you recall seeing those? In the I saw them. Were you concerned at all about those? I was not. Okay. Well, you can take it down. Thank you very much, Brett. When you met with uh, Dr. Diamond, um, the first time you met with him, you were in the room with him. Do you remember that? The first time I met with Dr. Yeah, the first time Dr. Diamond met with Ross Harris, you were in the room with, with him. Yes. Okay. Yes. Do you recall um, if Dr. Diamond took any notes or anything at that time? My recollection is he had a laptop. With, so. Yeah, yeah, he had a laptop because we were in a we were in an interview room at the jail. He carried that lap laptop everywhere, okay. everywhere. Now you were talking before about the. Um... not putting him on the stand. Uh, did you have, uh, and, and you mentioned some reasons that uh, that you had talked about. Was there a controlling factor in the decision about not calling him? Yes. What was that controlling factor? The court's order requiring us to turn over that, uh, those confidential work product materials. And whose decision was that? The court's. Okay, but whose decision was it not to call Dr. Diamond? Well, at the end of the day, I was lead counsel, so it was, it was, I'm the one who made the call. And you're the one that talked to Dr. Diamond afterwards? Yes, it was me. What was his demeanor? Well, he wasn't, he was disappointed. 
he was hurt. Frankly, he was hurt and he was disappointed. And I mean, we tried to, I mean, I tried to give him as many reasons as possible to make him feel better about it, but he was, he was very, very disappointed. He had a lot of emotional investment in the case and wanted to, uh, wanted to do right by, um, uh, by the truth. Thanks. Anything else I said, thank you. You're welcome. Your Honor, if I may have a few more questions. Yes, go ahead with recross. Thank you. So Mr. Kilgore, on August 10th of 2015, you said there was a three and a half hour meeting. Was that all at the jail? Some of it at the jail? Could you tell us about how much time you spent actually meeting with Mr. or Dr. Diamond and then going to the jail? How did that all work out? Yes. Yeah, so what my notes reflect is that that meeting was at the jail. That does not encompass other other times we met with him at our office or breakfast or whatever. Uh, my notes say at the jail. At the jail. All right. And this is where you're in the interview room at the jail. And I think you said it was yourself, Mr. Rodriguez, your investigator and Dr. Diamond. Is that correct? <sighs> To the best of my recollection, hang on one sec. Let me check something. My notes actually indicate Mr. Lumpkin was there too. So the entire defense team and the investigator and Dr. Diamond in the interview room with Mr. Harris. That's what my notes reflect. Okay. And when Dr. Diamond had his laptop out, was he taking notes about what Mr. Harris was talking about? Um, I wasn't looking over his shoulder to see what he was typing, so I, I would not be a good historian for what, what he was typing. I, and I don't really expect you to be looking over his shoulder. Did he have the laptop up, and was he, in fact, typing during the meeting with Mr. Harris? To the best of my recollection, his laptop was open, and he, was, he, he had it open working. And to the best of your knowledge, at that meeting on August 10th of 2015, you didn't record it in any way, like audio or video or anything like that? Absolutely not. All right, that's all I have. I'll pass the witness. Thank you, Judge. You don't know what, um, as far as Dr. Diamond's um, was doing when he was uh, at the interview with his computer? <laughs> I, I do not. Okay. I, I don't know. I, I mean, pr presumably, if he'd taken any notes, I would have them. He would have given them to me. So um, he either he either was not taking notes or he was making notes of something that was discarded. Or um, I mean, that's right. I, I don't know. Okay. Then okay. Now, um, if um, do you know if he had any? Uh, any proper, do you know what he did to prepare for that meeting? And if you don't, yeah, you know, I mean, you know, I don't just speculate, I guess what I'm saying. I cannot recall at this time whether we met with him in our office prior to going to the jail or we met with him after going to the jail. I, I don't have a clear recollection of that. Was that the first time he was in Georgia? I believe that it was. Had y'all been to Tampa at that time? Not yet. We we later went to Tampa. Is, it was this when he was first starting uh, working with you guys? It was been offic officially retained. It, it was his first trip to Georgia. It was his first trip here. We had been providing him information uh, in advance of that. In advance of that meeting. And uh, you had testified uh, yesterday that this um, discovery was ongoing and learning things was ongoing throughout this case. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Nothing else. Anything further from the state? No, Your Honor. All right. Witness can be excused. Thank Mr. you. 
What would your next witness be? Uh, Mr. Lumpkin. All right. Can we bring him up? Or in? Anyway, Judge, if I could split around it, never mind. That's if right. I'd rather let him do this call on Mr. Rodriguez. I think Mr. Lumpkin is there. If he's already here, then he's already here, right? Okay. What do you want? Who do you prefer, Mr. Lumpkin? I didn't hear you. Mr. Lumpkin will be fine. Good. There he is. Good day, sir. Can you swear him properly? No, ma'am, we cannot. Then I'll do it. Well, you can't judge. He's, he's muted. <laughs> well, he can, he can okay, say Okay, there we go. I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> Now I'm ready. All right, Mr. Lumpkin, you do solemnly swear from the evidence you shall give in the matter pending shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you, God. Do you so hey. sweet? Thank you. Mr. Durham, conduct your examination, please. All right. Um, Mr. Lumpkin, uh, how are you today? I'm doing well. Hey. Tell your name for the record, please. Uh, I am T. Brian Lumpkin. What do you do for a living? I'm an attorney in the state of Georgia. I've uh, been licensed since 1995. I do criminal defense, practice nearly 100%. And did you do anything before you started criminal defense? I was a prosecutor for the state of Georgia as an assistant DA for 10 and a half years. And um, your, where's your office at? Uh, my office is currently on uh, Lawrence Street, just down from the courthouse here in Marietta, Cobb County, Georgia. And is that where your practice uh, primarily is based? That's correct. And on cases yeah. throughout, throughout the metro area. Okay. Have you had an occasion in this to represent Ross Harris in this case? Absolutely. All right. Well, tell us, um, when did you come on in the case? I don't recall specifically uh, the date of it. It was well after Ross had been arrested and the investigation had been going on for some time. Um, I want to say maybe even a year afterwards that uh, Mr. Kilgore had approached me about uh, possibly being of assistance in the case. And um, did you have meetings and talk about the case when you came on? We did. What was... Uh, you all steer your strategies about how the best uh, route to defend Ross Harris uh, against these charges. So primarily, of course, we were focused on uh, showing that there was uh, no intention by Mr. Harris to have committed any sort of harm or danger to his child. He loved his child and uh, had been a good father for uh, the entirety of the child's life. Um, and that, that was our primary focus uh, as we began getting information from the state, uh, looking at what they were saying and what they were doing, uh, it became apparent that we were also going to need to show that there was a uh, lack of credibility in their investigation as to what they were putting out and how they were going about getting information in the case. What do you mean about lack of credibility? Well, of course, the front end of this case, um, what, in my mind at least, gave it so much attention were uh, statements made about uh, Mr. Harris alleging that he had researched how to kill a child or researched hot car deaths or uh, had made some sort of plans or, or um, internet searches about that. And uh, as we looked at the evidence, we found out that was completely untrue. Uh, but that narrative had been put out there for quite some time. And as we learned, uh, had been uh, testified to under oath that it was true, uh, along with several other things, and uh, came clear to us that they they were moving forward trying to satisfy what their theory was without regards for some of the truth of what had actually happened. All right, well, when you say you're going after their credibility, I just wanted you to define the credibility for me. Sure. So um, whether or not uh, jurors would be able to trust what uh, certified law enforcement officers would testify to, uh, whether or not they could trust uh, the suggestions that were being made, uh, ultimately, could they buy into a theory 
that the state might offer into the case to try to suggest that this was anything other than an accident. Now, um, and so uh, let's go on as far as what your, what your roles were. Okay. So we, uh, we separated the case into different parts because it's quite voluminous, as you well know, certainly. Um, my role generally was going to be dealing with um, the evidence collection and seizure searches and seizures of evidence in the case. Um, I would have some other minimal roles as they became necessary with individual witnesses. Um, but for the most part, I, I was dealing with the, uh, from the crime scene forward as to how evidence was gathered, maintained and handled. Okay. Now, um, did you, and you mentioned that you were um, in charge of the search and seizure portions. Correct. Okay. So, uh, there was a lengthy hearings on uh, the search warrants. Were you in charge of those? Uh, well, certainly I, I was the attorney responsible for presenting our, our motion and the evidence to the court. Okay. And how did you go about doing that? So we, um, well, we, we prepared the motion, of course, and uh, the state has a burden of proof, burden of proof to uh, justify what they've done. So as they called officers that were involved in the uh, obtaining of evidence from a cell phone to computers to uh, the scene itself um, and then subsequent searches of all those, obviously in this case, the searching of cell phones and computer evidence, forensic evidence um, of a digital nature was very important. And um, so I was tasked to look at each one of these search warrants identify specific things in them that were at issue legally. Um, in the motion to suppress, of course, we're looking at uh, whether or not there's probable cause in the warrant, uh, whether or not there's been um, misleading done to the magistrate in creating the warrant, uh, whether or not the execution of the warrant has been done properly, and whether or not they've exceeded any other constitutional bounds uh, in the process of obtaining and or executing the warrants. Now, um, and uh, you mentioned mis any misleading done. Um, did you find that to be uh, an issue? Absolutely. It, it, it was incredible uh, in my mind how, how often I think there were 10 search warrants were obtained uh, with statements in them that were completely not based in the evidence. Um, that, that, that was bothersome to me to say the least. Um, they then changed some language at some point and then I think got another 12, 18 other warrants uh, that still had some misleading in them as far as I was concerned. And um, I felt like that was an, an important issue to address uh, for the court to be aware to see if the um, would be concerning enough to the court that they were willing to lie to a magistrate in order to get them get uh, evidence that they otherwise might be entitled to. Is that part of the basis for why uh, trying to uh, go after the validity of the search warrants? Uh, you had the motion hearings? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, ultimately, um, was the, uh, your motions to suppress the search warrants denied? They were denied. All right. So then um, you start going, getting ready for the trial. Okay. Um, Let's talk about that then. As far as the trial, what uh, aspects, how did y'all divide that up? So we were still in pretty much the same uh, separation of duties, following on those same uh, general areas as far as the type of witnesses would be called, um, simply because we were already familiar with, with the information firsthand. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez was handling most of the computer forensic information. Uh, I was handling a lot of the law enforcement uh, evidence part, uh, apart from a lead detective. And uh, Mr. Gilbert was handling uh, the majority of the, the bulk of the rest of it. Okay. And um, what, as far as uh, your duties is, uh, in, the, in the trial when it came to, um, did there come a point that you tried to call Detective Murphy? We did, absolutely. Tell me about that. So, so we were 
put in a position to call Detective Murphy, uh, in our case in chief, because as we were trying the case, the state was putting on its case, uh, we had um, got to the point of addressing some of this misinformation that had been given out by the police and in attempts to question the lead detective about it. Uh, the state objected and uh, claimed it was hearsay that he wasn't the one who had gotten any of these search warrants and uh, that we needed to call that witness. And um, my review of the transcript, I see I wasn't part of the bench conference where it was said, but uh, the transcript bears out that uh, they were informed, okay, then we'll, we'll call the detective. If you're not going to call the second in command of this entire investigation, then uh, we'll certainly call him and we'll address it. And uh, that seemed to satisfy Let's everybody. Stop here. Real, let, me, let me just stop a second. If um, when they were when they had that bench conference, that was the end of the uh, Detective Stoddard's testimony. That's correct. And, and uh, so, that if I'm hearing what you just said, you were trying to get the information out through Detective Stoddard. That's right. Mr. Kilgore was questioning him, and as I recall, he had led into a question that was going to specifically ask about information provided uh, in sworn testimony in the previous. Okay. To the magistrate. Now, you um, part of the, I mean, were you aware of what what the basis that the defense team was trying to get that information in through Detective Stoddard? What was the purpose of it? Absolutely. So, so we were trying to show, we were trying to let the jury see actual evidence of the lack of credibility that we saw in this investigation. We wanted them to, to be able to address the the biased motive that we believe that the state had created in this case, how they were supporting that by obtaining of evidence to the point of misstating evidence to a magistrate judge under oath. So we wanted to bring that out. All right. And um, did the, the validity of the search warrants play any part into that when you were trying to, um, when the defense team was trying to cross-examine um, the detective Stoddard? The... The the legal validity of the search warrant certainly was not an issue anymore. The court had ruled on that, and we didn't go into that. Uh, and had you uh, preserved those issues for uh, appeal when we needed it? Uh, absolutely. I feel like we preserved every way we possibly could. Okay. Now, um, so you called Detective Murphy. What happened? So as we called Detective Murphy, well, I think he hired us physically calling him to state on the motion uh, eliminate. Um, either the Friday before that Monday or the day, I forget exactly which day it was, but basically suggesting that we shouldn't even be able to call a witness uh, that we'd all at least discussed that that was going to happen some days before. Um, we addressed that. They indicated that they were worried about hearsay being obtained from Detective Murphy. Uh, I addressed the court with regards to that, that we were not trying to obtain any hearsay. Uh, we were simply trying to put in the actual statements uh, of the, or the investigation that included the statements made under oath uh, by Detective Murphy uh, in order to try to figure it out. Where did that information come from? Uh, why was that created? Uh, who created it? And uh, why was it told to a magistrate when the evidence did not bear it out? Um, we weren't, uh, the judge granted the motion. Um, as I recall, I was a little bit unclear of exactly what the court was going to let us do or not do. Ultimately, we called Detective Murphy, proceeded to ask him some questions. And uh, any time that I attempted to address uh, this very issue of the credibility of the investigation, state objected and the court sustained it. And, um, ultimately, we placed a proper on the record as to what it was we were trying to uh, get out in front of the jury <clears throat> and our purpose for doing that to um, defend Mr. Harrison. Uh, the lack of credibility of the investigation and attack the motive that they had created. And you've also given the reason why you wanted to do that today to, uh, before us as well. That's right. Now, did you, um, so you, in the, the proffer you made was before the court um, and uh, you were allowed to, to um, cross-examine, or excuse me, to question Detective Murphy about a few issues. Is that right? That's correct. Um, did it touch on any of the issues that you had really gotten in there for? <clears throat> I 
it did not allow us to address what probably was our priority for calling him. Certainly wanted to bring out some uh, incidental other facts as well, which included the, the light bulbs that had been purchased that uh, that wasn't some made up excuse to, to get light bulbs, but in fact, the house needed them. And uh, he took part in searching that to find that out. Um, regarding the things he had said about his observations of the car seat and straps, where they were placed yep. in the car seat. Uh, felt like I'm, I'm sorry, about that. I just finished. <laughs> Uh, had y'all planned to call Detective Murphy um, in your case in chief uh, before um, y'all were denied an opportunity to cross-examine Detective Stoddard? No, no. He was not under spin or anything until that bench conference was had in the midst of Detective Stoddard's testimony. All right, so he wasn't planning to be testified until at that point. Is that right? Is that what I heard? No, that's my recollection. Absolutely. Thank you for your time, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Can I proceed, Ron? Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, Mr. Lumpkin? I can. I'm hearing a little bit of background noise, but I think I can pick your, your voice out. Thank you, Mr. Tenikoski. I'm trying to see if it may be coming from Macon State, but we'll, we'll, we'll proceed. No um, so the state did not call Detective Sean Murphy in its case in chief. That's correct. Right. The state did call Detective Stoddard in his case in chief. That's correct. And Mr. Kilgore is the one who did the direct examination of Detective Stoddard. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. And Detective Stoddard is not the one who took out the search warrants um, for the cell phones and computers involved in this case. Is that correct? He certainly did not take out the initial ones. I believe he did take out some of the search warrants, but I, I can't recall specifically what they were for. Okay. And at the three day long motion to suppress the search warrants, um, you handled that? I did. Okay. And Detective Murphy was on the stand for that. Is that correct? He was, amongst others. Okay. And regarding this entire case, the strategy here, as I think you've said, is to attack the state's hypothesis that the motive uh, behind Mr. Harris killing his child um, and that this motive somehow was created by the state. Is that right? In addition to the primary uh, theory, of course, that he was, this was completely an accident, not intentional. Uh, absolutely, we were trying to show that the theory that they had created did not fit the evidence of the facts in any rational way. And do you feel that you were able to do that, get that out in front of the jury? No, no, we weren't allowed to put up the evidence which bore that out, uh, at least in my part, as to um, Detective Murphy. Okay, so I, I, that was me badly phrased. Overall, um, were you able to, was Mr. Kilgore able to attack the credibility of Detective Stoddard through his um, cross-examination? Uh, I think Mr. Kilgore certainly did attack the credibility of Detective Stoddard and uh, was able to get him to at least to some extent admit to some uh, false statement he had given previously. Okay. So generally overall, your primary strategy was, this was an accident, no intent by Mr. Harris. Is that correct? Correct. And then the second strategy was to attack the credibility of the law enforcement officers um, in, under, in, un, in order to undermine the motive evidence that the state was presenting. Yeah, that's correct. But to be clear, it's not as though one was lesser than the other. Uh, I, and it's my wording, I think I, I said secondarily, uh, they were working hand in hand, right? Uh, to the extent that we believe that evidence was clear, he did not intentionally do this in order to combat how the state was trying to uh, show otherwise, it was the lack of credibility of the investigation that they were using to do that. So we were trying to highlight how that had happened. Okay, so overall with both of these strategies, have you used those before in trial as a criminal defense attorney? Absolutely. Okay. And they're effective strategies, aren't they? Uh, I have found them to be effective at times. All right. and 
was it your strategy and did you actually follow through with the exception of what we're talking about, Sean Murphy, the rest of the trial, were you able to cross-examine uh, Detective Grimstead and uh, Detective Stoddard and the other GBI agents who testified at this case, in this case? Um, as you noted, I didn't handle the examination, but no, we were not allowed to cross-examine Detective Stoddard about these very same issues. The state objected that it was hearsay. Uh, as to Detective Grimstead, absolutely, we were able to cross-examine him quite a bit. Um, I don't recall him doing or saying anything that was false. In fact, it was his accurate keeping of information that allowed us to show how this, frankly, the, the state thereafter had created a scene that did not ever exist. Um, I don't recall if there was another witness you indicated that we wanted to address. Obviously, Ted Murphy didn't get to address it at all. Okay. And... The light bulb issue, uh, just as an example, that was brought out during the state's case in chief, correct? Uh, I don't recall that it was specifically. I think there were some photographs of light bulbs. Uh, and when you say the light bulb issue, we may be talking about two different things. Uh, I'm referring to the fact that the home, the residents, the Harris residents had some light bulbs that needed replacing in a bathroom, as I recall. And uh, Mr. Harris had bought bathroom bulbs that matched those exactly uh, on the day of this incident. And uh, so to the extent that we were trying to show that it wasn't some made up reason to get light bulbs just so he could go to his car and check on how things were going, as was suggested by the state and refuted by the evidence, in my opinion, um, there was an actual need for the bulbs and he got them and he placed them in the car without ever getting inside the car. And that was presented at trial, correct? Uh, that was presented at trial through Detective Murphy. I, I don't recall, I think the original question, I, I don't think anybody else had testified to that specific extent about seeing the bulbs and matching them up. And in your extensive experience as both a prosecutor and a criminal defense attorney, have you ever had the occasion where a judge has made a ruling um, that's affected your next decision or your tri ongoing trial strategy? Absolutely. I'll pass the witness. Uh, a couple of quick questions, Mr. Lumpkin. Um, Primarily, let's go to the, um, the last question that was asked to you was uh, basically has it, uh, a judge ever overruled you or kept you from uh, presenting anything? Is that right? That's, that's how I understood the question and my answer corresponds to that. Absolutely. Well, in this case, um, was the false information uh, that y'all um, found that uh, had been provided to the magistrates. And you said how many times? There were at least 10 warrants initially uh, involved in the case within the first couple of days of the investigation, I recall. Um, and thereafter, I believe there were between 12 more and eight or 18 more, I forget. Certainly well over two, do two dozen warrants were secured. Okay. Uh, and they all, in, in, in all varied in degree, but uh, you're, you're, um, contention is they provided false testimony. That's correct. Okay. And was that a important part of your defense theory? Uh, I certainly believe it was very important. Okay. Why? What were you trying to show? Sure. So we were trying to show the extent to which law enforcement was willing to, um, well, we we're trying to show the lack of credibility that they had by showing actual evidence of the extent to which they would go to mislead, mischaracterize, or outright lie under oath to a judge. If they were willing to do that, then certainly they're coming to testify in this trial. It would hardly be a stretch for them to mislead, mischaracterize, or lie to the jury. So we want to show they, Did you think they were being even-handed or um, in, in, in their pursuit of this case? 
Absolutely not. I think they're, everything was biased in their mind at whatever point they made the decisions, and it continued to get worse as I saw it. Did you have a theory as to why they were biased? Well, I don't know if I have couch in terms of theory. Did I have? I certainly had a belief that they had they had made an arrest of Ross Harris before they got all the information, and um, and they would not relent. And they they decided they did not. They got information about him. They didn't like him, and uh, so they decided to find evidence, whatever they could find, to support. Uh, that he was just a, a horrible guy rather than look at what was really happening with this child. And I um, thought the evidence bore out very clearly that there was not a, an inch of evidence he had any malice or dislike for his child. He loved his child. Okay. And to do something of this nature was beyond, beyond understanding and certainly without any evidence to support it. Okay. Thanks. Yes, sir. Wait. Judge, hold on one second. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Nothing further from the state. Mr. Durham, do you have another witness? I have Carlos Rodriguez, Your Honor. May I remain and listen to the rest of the testimony? If I remove my video, will that be okay? Is there any objection by either party? Okay, we may do so. Thank you, Your Honor. There's Mr. Rodriguez. Mr. Rodriguez, raise your right hand. You do solemnly swear from if you should give in the matter pending should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Do you so swear? Swear. Proceed, Mr. Durham. I'll tell us your name, please. Uh, good morning. My name is Carlos Rodriguez. And hey, Mr. Rodriguez, where do you work? Uh, I'm an attorney uh, here in Marietta. I have a small law firm, criminal defense firm, Kilgore and Rodriguez. And uh, <clears throat> what areas of law do you practice? Criminal defense. Do you, and you, you said you were uh, Kilgore and Rodriguez. Would that be uh, Max um, Kilgore? That's right. The lead attorney in this case. And um, how long have you been in practice? Since 2010, 10 years. Now, um, and how much have you practiced? Have you been primarily a uh, in private practice your entire career? Yes. So, um, in this case, uh, did you have, um, how long have you been with Maddox, Kilgore? I believe we started our firm in the summer of 2014. Okay, and so um, did you um, become part of the team that helped uh, defend Ross Harris in this case? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, tell me about what y'all started as far as, uh, did you start in it initially or did you come in later on? No, from the very beginning I was involved. So um, did you have uh, meetings and discuss strategies and, uh, and ideas and the best way to attack the case and to defend Mr. Uh, Harris? Yes, formal meetings, informal. I mean, we practice in the same building, so um, we probably talked about this case every, every day. Okay. So the, um, what was your defense theory or theories? Um, well, it was, uh, I guess, a two-pronged 
uh, defense. Uh, one, that it was an accident, that Ross did not intentionally leave Cooper in the car, um, that he was a loving father, um, that he wasn't, you know, he wouldn't have done this intentionally, that this was a memory failure, um, and that uh, there was a, a rush to judgment by law enforcement and and the prosecution to think otherwise. And so um, there's the accident component, um, really a legal defense, but then um, a factual defense where it was exposing the bias of the investigation from the state and prosecution from the state. Okay. And did y'all uh, split up duties in the case? Yes. Okay. Um, what were you assigned to do? Um, well, um, I mean, I guess under the general umbrella of electronic evidence, um, my my responsibility was to try and lay eyes on everything in this case. Um, every every piece of evidence that was obtained from uh, Ross's computers, from Ross's cell phones, from email accounts, social media accounts. I mean, any anything that was electronic surveillance videos. Um, I mean, and, and I was responsible for specific witnesses in the case. I can't, um, I can't recall or or list them right That's now. Okay. I just, uh, so basically, you were the computer geek. I mean, um, yeah, for lack of a better word, although I don't <laughs> think I'm a computer geek, but <laughs> okay. Well, um, I was did, you have, to be. <laughs> did you have a, a occasion to um, be in charge of uh, the evidence? Uh, as far as uh, Mr. Persinger for the state, the state's expert computer. Yes, expert. that was the uh, state's private computer expert. Um, in, in addition to the detectives with um, Cobb County Police High Tech Crimes, I was responsible for all of those, all of those witnesses. All right, talk to me a little bit about Mr. Persinger now. When um, uh, you were preparing for his um, testimony, did you receive anything? Uh, in regards to uh, his testimony? So, um, I specifically can recall him creating a report um, from, uh, I think it was PM Investigations was the name of his, uh, his company. Um, obviously, um, and I don't have his file, um, but the way that we would organize the preparation of witnesses is we would have really everything from discovery that had to do with that witness, we would have them in a folder. And so I know that I would have had uh, Mr. Persinger's report that he created. Um, any police reports in discovery that would have mentioned him, uh, any items of evidence that I anticipated that he would have testified about. Um, and I believe that there may have been some handwritten notes, um, detectives notes that were provided in discovery about Mr. Persinger. Um, I think generally the, those are the things that well, the uh, provided about to us report. about Persinger. Go ahead. Okay, let's talk about his report. What did he, uh, did, did he, did, he gave a report of what he, he was uh, assigned to testify to? Yes. Tell me about that. So it was, it was basically two things. Um, the whisper image, um, do I need to explain to you what the whisper image is or are we, are we past that? No, we're not past that, but though you said there's two things, give me the two things. And then okay, we'll the whisper image and this uh, video on YouTube that was a veterinarian doing a demonstration about how, how hot it gets in a car and uh, reminding folks not to leave their pets in the car when they you know, go shopping. So it was a, uh, like a public service announcement, or is that what you know, we're calling it during the trial? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, just briefly tell us what that Whisper image was. So Whisper is an application. It's a, a social media application where um, 
a user can post a image or a photograph and they, it can be like a stock photograph provided by the application and the user assigns text to the picture. So like if I were a user on Whisper and it's, anon it's supposed to be anonymous. So if I was a user on Whisper, I could um, type, you know, I'm testifying in court today and the application might generate a photo of a courtroom and then um, it puts it out there for the Whisper world, all users um, that have that application to see. And then there's a component that allows um, Whisper users to chat and communicate based on or comment on, on the images. And so in this case, Mr. Persinger was, um, as best I could tell, he was tasked to um, look into the whisper image and find out as much as he could about it. And ultimately there was a whisper image that was not posted by or created by Ross. Ross commented or- hey, hey, Stop it just for a second. When you, you use the phrase whisper image, was, it, was the task for a specific whisper image? Yeah, a specific whisper image. It was um, someone had said something to the effect of, I hate being married with kids. And it was, uh, I remember it being the big bright red image. I think the state blew it up, um, blew it up. I mean, had a, a large um, reproduction of it, like on poster board. All right. And um, was that a trial or the probable cause hearing or both or what? I can't recall if it was that probable cause. I, it, I, I think it was testified to on probable cause, but as far as having the big blow up of it, I, I, that was at trial. Okay. And it was something along the lines of, I hate being married with kids. Did um, that ever get um, attributed to Ross Harris posting that? Ever at trial? We say never a trial. Did it ever get a trip? No, I'm, I'm, I'm asking for clarification. Like ever. Oh, okay. um, well, then uh, was at any time. Oh, yeah. I mean, for, so, I mean, there were detectives notes that suggested that they were 80 percent sure that Ross had had created and posted the whisper image. Um, that whisper image, the one about being or hate hating being married with kids. Um, and certainly at the probable cause hearing, um, it was suggested that he was the creator of that post. And it was part and parcel with the state's theory that he wanted to live a child free life and that that was the purported motivation to kill his son was to rid himself of his marriage and being a dad. Now, did um, as time went on with all the electronic and technology uh, and social media communications, did things become clearer about uh, what information was or the sources of it? Clearer for us or clearer for the state? Well, I mean, clearer for, for, for y'all. What clear for anybody, any objective person, how's that? Did you well, get more information as the case went along to find yeah. out? Okay, all right. Well, it was, I mean, it was clear to us I mean, very early on, as soon as we heard that, that it wasn't Ross. I mean, Ross only had one child. It, it obviously became clear to the to Cobb County Police and um, the state sometime after the probable cause hearing. Did, but as the case goes on, this case progressed, um, and more things were discovered through uh, search warrants, uh, through whatever, information you could get to go through the technology and you could tie into who sent what on these social media things. Is that, is, am I correct in that? Sorry, can, you, can you ask that? Can you ask that again? I'm sorry. Sure. Um, what I'm trying to find out is, you know, there's been testimony that this was ongoing discovery. A lot of things were coming out and things were, uh, there was information that you would have early, but you needed to check into it later on. And the investigations had to be done on the sources of those information. Right. Okay. Is that true? Yes. And is this whisper image something like that, that it became apparent more later on as 
the case went on and more investigation went in as to where the source came from. Um, I would say that's true, but it certainly would have been prior to uh, attempting to try the case in Cobb County. It was definitely before that because Mr. Persinger had turned over that report prior to the, the first attempt to try the case in Cobb. Okay. And you mentioned that uh, I hate being married with kids, that paraphrasing of that uh, whisper image. Was that found to definitely not be sent by Justin Ross Harris? Oh, definitely. Yeah, it was definitely not him. Okay. And all right. So, uh, and that was one of the tasks that Mr. Um, Persinger um, did. Um, Ross, uh, was Ross ever attributed to a follow up to that comment? Uh, yes. Um, he commented on it. Um, R Ross had responded to that that image or responded to the person that that wrote it and created it. Do you remember what that response was? Um, it was a series of responses. I think there it was a, a kind of a back and forth, but um, you know, Ross was encouraging. He certainly did not suggest that he hated being married or he hated having a child. Um, in fact, I, I think what he specifically said was that he loved his son. Um, and, um, but suggested, you know, sometimes we need, we all need escapes or, you know, we all need a break or something like that. That was, uh, that, that statement was attributed to Ross. Yeah, Ross, Ross wrote that. Yeah. All right. So now let's go into the next thing that, um, uh, under his report that person was tasked to do. And that was the, uh, PSA video. Right. And, and what was he? Uh, what was the task there? I mean, I don't know really because you know Ross admitted in his interview to having viewed it. Um, I think perhaps Persinger, at least by my memory of the report, he just confirmed that it was um, there was history on Ross's computer of having access that video all right was there some concern early on about searches or research being done by uh, ross harris for um, videos of uh, deaths in cars yes okay and was the uh this vet video the psa was that part of that initial concern yes so i i believe what was um, what was originally testified to in the probable cause hearing, alluded to in pretrial hearings, um, sworn to in search warrants, was that he, that Ross stated that he had researched how long it took for a child to die in a car and the temperature necessary for that to happen. And um, I mean, Obviously, after reviewing the evidence and doing our own investigation into all the electronic evidence um, and his interview, not only did Ross not say that, but he didn't do those things. He did not research or search for how long it takes for a child to die in a car. And um, he wasn't actively researching hot cars or children dying in cars or children dying or anything of the sort. It was basically yeah. a video that just popped up on his feed um, or that he was redirected to after some post on Reddit. So um, those were the two items that Mr. Persinger was tasked with according to his report. Yes, yeah, very basic. Okay, and um, What did he did he testify to anything other than that? Oh yeah. So the, the whisper image and the vet video was merely in my in my mind uh, a fraction of what his testimony was really about. He gave this demonstration based on um, a series of like screenshots or captures of 
hit of Ross's Google Chrome preferences, and he gave this demonstration about um, changes in Ross's um, internet preferences. And he uh, talked about a particular website of www.griffinpsychology.com and that this was a website that um, Ross had essentially um, um, indicated or designated as a favorite in his internet preferences, that it was a website that he somehow had control over, that he was able to change, um, change that website, um, but that uh, Mr. Persinger had gone to uh, that website himself in preparation for uh, his testimony and had seen that it was a psychologist that um, was, I guess, uh, advertising or describing some of the services that he provided, which was involved with the criminal justice system, like jury selection or something like that. And uh, did it come out later uh in his testimony that um, Ross Harris actually was a website developer for Griffin Psychology? So I, I wasn't a part of the conversation, but apparently during a lunch break, um, uh, Jesse Evans, the ADA responsible for his direct examination had brought it to Mr. Persinger's attention. So uh, was there any, uh, a dip, when before um, the lunch break, how what was the tone of the um, evidence toward Griffin psychology? Oh, it, it was so Mr. Persinger had like stepped up off the stand. They had it blown up on the big Mondo board, which was this big. It was basically a big television, interactive television, where you can plug in devices, um, flash drives, and you could plug in. Uh, exhibits and blow it up real big for the jury to see and you can manipulate it like a touch screen zoom in on things and um, I mean a really neat um, tool for advocacy and putting on your case and he put on this this show this demonstration about Griffin psychology and that it essentially painting this um, this picture that it was very suspicious for Ross to have been visiting this website. And, and um, that's certainly how I took the point being made, which was, um, and I think Mr. Persinger even said that, uh, that this inter internet behavior was uh, uh, indicated someone that's like a Dr. Jekyll or a Mr. Hyde during this part of his testimony. Um, Okay. And so that was before the lunch break. Before the lunch break. And then after the lunch break, um, you said the tone. Uh, what, is that what, what came out after lunch break? Um, I mean, in regards to Griffin psychology, it was that, um, you know, Mr. Evans had brought to um, Mr. Persinger's attention that uh, Ross Harris was actually doing some website work for uh, Dr. Michael Griffin and um, and basically that Mr. Persinger knew nothing about that and the state wanted to leave it at that. Um, just that, you know, he, he didn't know anything about that. But it, uh, it come out when uh, the Griffin psychology information had been uncovered by Mr. Persinger. So yeah, so he, um, he testified that he had only learned about the griffinpsychology.com web preference like three or four days before his testimony. Um, and that that's the reason why it wasn't included in his original report from, I don't know, seven months prior. Um, and that the screenshots well, they, they tried to suggest that the only the only uh, value or the only importance in referencing Griffin psychology was just to show that it was in his web preferences. But obviously, that wasn't the purpose of the demonstration, and that wasn't the purpose of him describing why or what is all on the website and what Dr. Michael Griffin does. 
Now, um, did the other information come out during his testimony that was not on that report? Yes. So he testified about um, looking into uh, a search about how to survive in prison, which Ross never searched. Uh, there was testimony about um, uh, some information, some web history about uh, a, a sandals um, resort testimony about um, um, yeah, I, I, what, what would the uh, sandals resort why would that be um, something that uh, would be brought up during the trial oh uh, because they wanted to suggest that Ross was planning some trip without Leanna and his child because apparently oh. there was apparently Mr. Persinger had found um some uh, some data on the computer where uh, it, a sandals website was visited and in the in the booking form portion of the website there were there was a selection of two adults and zero children and so the only thing that I could come up with is that they were trying to suggest that Ross was planning a trip without Cooper. Okay. And but, but none uh, of that was in his report. Okay. And, and um, let's see. The, uh, was there anything regarding um, real estate or anything like that? I don't think that he offered any, um, any direct testimony about real estate. Um, I don't think so. I, and I know that he, he talked about, um, he talked about the clearing of his cash. That's, that, that's one big topic that they, that they honed in on is that Ross had cleared his cash, which is the temporary internet files on his Google Chrome browser, but he didn't do that on some other browser. And that that was indicative of someone that's a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, that he's doing, you know, I mean, it was all, it Explain was us who, show um, that was not in his report. Okay. Explain to us uh, who um, aren't quite as uh, technologically gifted as you are um, about um, clearing your cash. Okay. So um, your browser or your computer uh, will store temporary internet files or temporary internet information about a website that the website automatically pushes to your computer, sends to your computer when you visit that website, okay? The reason that a website does that is so if you visit that same website in the future, it'll be a lot faster to load the page and all the information on the page because small temporary internet files about that website have already been saved on your computer. So it's, it's not something that you, that the user actively downloads from the website. Okay. If you clear your internet cache, then you are removing that information that the website has automatically pushed to your computer. And so your browser has to load the information on that website all over again from scratch okay, okay. so um how many uh browsers did um were attributed to ross harris um i i know that he used safari i know that he used google chrome i know that he used mozilla firefox okay let me just go there two uh had, what were uh, being concentrated on in Mr. Persinger's testimony? So Mr. Persinger was doing a, he was trying to juxtapose the activity on the Mozilla Firefox against the, um, the web history and internet cache on the Google Chrome, two different browsers. Okay. And, um, did he make any comments about the comparison between those two? Yeah, he said that it was suspicious. 
it was highly suspicious and indicative of someone that's trying to hide something. Okay, now, um, and this came out during his um, testimony and it was not provided to you beforehand? Yeah, that, that opinion was nowhere in his report. What about the other things we talked about earlier as far as the um, how to survive in prison and the sandals vacation thing? Yeah, nowhere in his report. So, uh, and Griffin Psychology wasn't in his report? No. Okay. All right. Now, in your um, defense of Ross Harris, what was what did you try to do? Well, I mean, so originally my plan was to um, confront Jim Persinger with the fact that all he was tasked to do was uh, look into the whisper post, which we know that Ross was not the creator of the, you know, I hate being married to kids post um, and the vet video. And he really offered no further assistance at least based on his report, no further assistance to the state. That's been my plan. That had been kind of my, my line of attack. But um, when all of this came out for the very first time on direct about the Griffin psychology, it, it was clear to me that uh, Mr. Persinger either did not know that Ross was working as a web developer and, and, try, and starting a new business where Michael Griffin was a client and he was working on his website, or they were hoping that I didn't know and we're gonna try and pull a fast one. And so <clears throat> at that moment, um, we kind of pivoted or I, I kind of pivoted and my, my plan was to confront um, Jim Persinger with all of the data that would have been obvious to him as a computer forensics expert. And he testified multiple times about digging deeper, okay, about being thorough in his investigation. So having held himself out as this thorough investigator, someone that trains law enforcement and provides support for Cobb County high tech crimes. I wanted to confront him with all the easily available, easily discoverable uh, information in emails and chats that would have made clear to him that he was not involved with Griffin psychology in some sort of nefarious plan or conniving plan to prepare for a criminal trial, but that um, all of that information really would have exposed how biased his investigation was, biased in favor of the state, not, in, not really a, a modest attempt to search for the truth, but just cobbling together the state's theory that everything that Ross did on his computer is suspicious that everything he did must be because of some motivation to um, to live a child-free life, which obviously wasn't the case. All right, so um, you, you said that you wanted to go get information that's uh, easily discoverable and attainable for somebody. Did, did you get that information? Yes, it was already in evidence. Okay, it was already in evidence, so the state had it as well. Absolutely. I mean, the, the state had used Google chats um, that demonstrated this very thing with witnesses earlier in their case in chief, um, emails they had used earlier in their case in chief. Yeah. Now, um, so um, in regards to um, the Sandals vacation, right? what does... Um, what did you find? Well, that in fact, Ross had um, been planning on going on a family vacation with, I think his brother and sister-in-law and Leanna and, and, and Ross's parents, and it was a cruise. And there were all kinds of emails with a travel agent. And I can also recall 
that there were uh, some discussions between he and Leanna about wanting to go on a trip together without Cooper, just to have kind of like a, a trip for the two of them. Um, and had Mr. Persinger actually done a, a deep investigation, that would have easily been available to him and easily recognizable as something that defeats this suggestion that they were trying to make. And so I wanted to, I wanted to, in front of the jury, show that bias in his investigation. Did you um, attempt to do that? So um, with the specific vacation email, I did not because my first attempt was going to be to show and confront him with the uh, emails and chats about Griffin psychology. Okay. But when the state objected to um, basically the use of any emails and chats because they made clear on direct, he doesn't know anything about it. And so they wanted to leave it at that. He doesn't know anything about it. And so there's no foundation. He can't testify to it, even though he's an expert and actually mentioned these things. Let me go ahead then. Um, you uh, mentioned um, the, what is prison really like? Was it was uh, any emails or any information that you looked to try to confront him on that? Yeah. So, I mean, I was, I, I tried to ask questions about it, but what I wanted to be able to show were that there were Google chats, very easy to see, very easy to ask, uh, very easy to, um, to acquire where around the same time as the search that Ross actually made, which was what is prison really like? He was watching the show on Netflix, Orange is the New Black, which was a show about um, a women's prison. Okay. And so the, the timing was very clear. And, and Mr. Persinger testified about cross referencing evidence that he found um, with other sources of information. Okay. So this would have definitely um, undermined his. Uh, credibility and opinion that as a as a computer forensics expert, um, he was digging deeper and performing a thorough investigation into Ross's uh, digital history. And is that the same thing? That the same basis you were going after the information regarding Griffin psychology? Yeah, absolutely. And it was it's the same source of information. It was the um, Google chats and Google emails. And was there any uh, discussion about, um, you know, you mentioned the, the uh, deleting his cash, um, anything that you wanted to, uh, any information, emails or anything you wanted to confront him with regarding that issue? I'm, I'm sorry, say that again, what issue? You mentioned earlier about, you know, the, the, his deleting his cash or, or whatever the phrase was. Oh, right, right. So there, there were there were Google chats um, between Ross and uh, two of his uh, friends that were starting this new business, where they're talking about um, like uh, testing the testing the um, the website, and he's asking people, "Hey, go look at the website, test it, see if they have any issues." And there were even emails between Ross and Dr. Michael Griffin where he's talking about, I've mobile tested it and I've tested it on different browsers. And so it would have been clear to Mr. Persinger that had he read this email, seen this email, not only is he a web developer for Dr. Michael Griffin, but he's explaining to Dr. Michael Griffin that he is testing the functionality of the website on different browsers. Okay. Mr. Persinger said he was a web developer. That should mean that there isn't a suspicious, nefarious reason for him to be interacting with GriffinPsychology.com. Okay. And now, what uh, what steps did you take to try to confront and uh, uh, confront the witness? Um, I mean, so I definitely asked questions about it, but I wanted to be able to actually impeach the witness with the state's evidence. And so I tried to do that. Um, How did you try to do that? I, 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 so I tried to tender them as defense exhibits, um, the select portions of chats and emails. Um, that was objected to. Um, and then I tried. Let's stop it for a second. When you say that was objected, I just want to be clear on the record. Yeah. Uh, how, how did you do that? Did you put them on um, discs themselves, thumb drives or something? 
No, I, I believe I printed them. I, I believe I printed them out because what was in evidence was this, I mean, huge voluminous response from Google of all the chats that they had available, all the emails associated with his account. And so I couldn't- That would be, that would be state's exhibit. That was the state's exhibit. I, I don't remember. What, do you remember the number? Um, I mean, the 601. Hold on. Miss um, Demikowski gave me her response, and I think it's in there, her response to the motion for new trial. Would it I have been a 601, exhibit 601? That sounds right. Okay. All right. With well, the exhibit, but you uh, went to that exhibit and, and uh, got hard copies. Yes, exhibit states exhibit 601. And you got hard copies of it and you attempted to it, and they would not allow that. The state objected to it, so the judge wouldn't allow it. Okay. And then um, did you take the next step? Well, hold on. Why wouldn't they? Why was it not allowed in at that time? Well, wait. So when I printed them out, they, I mean, 601 was already in evidence. When I printed them out, I marked them individually as separate defense exhibits. The hard copies of the email. The hard copies, correct. And so when um, the objection, if I can recall, was, was lack of foundation. And the defense exhibits that I had printed out and was prepared to start confronting, start impeaching Persinger with were uh, merely singled out printouts of what was the larger piece of 601. And that didn't work, what'd you do next? So that didn't work. Um, and so my thought was, let me use 601 because there's, there's no foundational objection to that because it's already in evidence. I didn't think that there was really a legitimate foundational exception to the others because they were already in evidence. Um, but um, I tried to use what was already in the states in, in state's evidence. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and that was objected to and uh, you were not allowed to go further with that. Right, I mean, my belief was this was something, this was, you know, evidence or materials that I could impeach the witness with that drew his opinion and drew his credibility in question. All right, now, um, let's, okay, I think, how, well, one last thing as far as that, go. how did you go about, uh, was it the, the difficult task for you to, um, get those specific emails out of 601? So, um, no with, um, but, I, but I do recall having to have our computer forensics expert, Scott Moulton, he had to extract the, the, that data and convert it to PDF. Once he did that for us, it was very easy to search um, I mean, literally, you could you could search within your computer, like for the word orange, and it would direct you within the Google chats to any any place where the word orange had been used. And it was real easy to find it or prison um, or, you know, any any word. Okay. Griffin psychology. All right. Is. Um... During your preparation of the case, did you uh, was uh, did you find out if the state, um, when they tasked Mr. Persinger for those two two initial tasks, when he was assigned for those two initial tasks, um, were were you able to uh, find what information he was provided by the state? So, um, from what I from what I recall, he was he was given the um, full extraction of Ross's Apple MacBook 
and his work uh, and his uh, um, work computer, a Lenovo, as well as um, an iPhone 5. So he was given a data dump, everything on those devices. During his testimony, did he indicate he went back and got anything else during his uh, digging deeper? Yeah, I, I recall him, um, an example of him um, asking for Cobb County High Tech Crimes to provide him with more information about something. Okay. Um, All right. Now let's step on over. Um, did you have an occasion to uh, handle the portion of the trial regarding um, the 3D scanning? Yes. Okay. Um, give a well. I mean, did um, it, it just started, but before the trial back in. Um, April or so, were there any motion hearings regarding uh, the 3D scanning? Uh, yeah, Maddox handled those, Maddox Kilgore did. And um, the objections were made, um, do you recall that? Yes. And do you recall whether they were granted or denied? Our motion was denied. Okay, so the state was allowed to go forward with the scanning back in uh, April or so. Right. Okay, um, at that point, uh, Maddox had, was in control of the uh, 3D scannings? Um, I wouldn't say in control. I, I, and I, I just don't remember why, but he, he handled that pretrial motion for whatever reason. Okay, so he did the motion hearing now. At trial, um, you handled it. At trial, I handled it. All right, what happened? Can you just give us a, scenario, a, a brief summary of uh, what anything unusual happened? Um, so the car seat inside of Ross's SUV, um, it had been removed from the car and put back in, but it was put back in in a way that was not the way that the car seat was originally in Ross's car, okay? When the 3D scans were done, David Dustin came in and he didn't stage the scene for the scans. Either Phil Stoddard or other detectives um, with Cobb County, they did. And, and, and I guess maybe the DA's office was involved. I, I, I can't remember. But um, other people other than David Dustin staged the scene for the scanning. And then David Dustin scanned it. In the middle of trial, it, it came out that the way that the state had staged the scene was not accurate. And so they had to bring David Dustin back to Brunswick, or I, I say back, I don't know if he was there to begin with, but they had to bring him down so that they could stage the car and the car seat inside of the car so that David Dustin could scan it again. And you handled the testimony on that. I handled the testimony. Right. And he also scanned the car and the parking lots and created, uh, I mean, he created some demonstrations, some animations of those scans that were um, shown to the jury. But as far as something unusual, um, I mean, what jumps out at me was the, having to rescan the car and the car seat. And when were y'all provided uh, information? When did you first learn about the new scan? Um, I guess when the state told us that there was a new scan done in the middle of trial. So it was the middle of trial you found out about it. Yeah. yeah. I can't remember how far along we were. I mean, it was, if it, if it wasn't a month, it was close to a month after we started picking a jury, okay. after and, we had moved down there. And um, after hearing, uh, making your objections and other things and hearings, um, was the, state, the state allowed to introduce that, um, the 3D scans and the animation into trial? 
the new the new ones yes well and, and the old ones actually i think all the scans were introduced okay and so um you handle this uh, what 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 does it look like in court as far as how is the scan put up there the 3d scan i mean how is the jury seeing that how's it presented in court it, it kind of looks like a cartoon um I mean, it's, it's three dimensional, um, you know, it, it almost looks like a video game is really the best way that I can explain it. Um, it, it kind of, uh, there's a, a, a feature that um, Mr. Dustin was able to do, which is called like a fly through or a flyover video where it kind of gives you a bird's eye view. Oh, Okay. So we'll get there, but um, where do they put it? I mean, is it on a small television? Is it um, on a projector? How, how is it shown to the jury? Oh, oh, oh. Um, on that, on the Mondo board, on the uh, that that huge monitor that's interactive. You can you can hook a computer up to it. It's basically like a huge projector. Okay, the, 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 the huge screen, I guess. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now. Um, when he's presenting that, you mentioned you were talking something about a flyover. What is that? Um, this was something that um, he created. It's an animation that um, showed, I think what was played for the jury was an animation that showed uh, Ross's SUV um, where he had stopped um, and the Acres Mill shopping center. And so the flyover video, if I recall, it starts like at the intersection of Acres Mill um, going into the shopping center and it flies over it and it's slow and it gets closer and closer and it shows like the building where the, um, the pizza place is and it shows, you know, the street, um, it shows the car, the way that it was parked. Um, I mean, but it's from, a, it's from a bird's eye view. From a bird's eye view, and then as it gets closer, it, you I mean, you literally see the roof of the car hidden. It like disappears. It just kind of like just fades away. And then you can see um, this car seat, this animated car seat, and an animated child to represent Cooper sitting in the car seat. From above and, the car. What's that? Above the car, right. And like the windows are removed. Um, you can't see it. So it like creates this impression that the vehicle was like a convertible. But you can see, you can clearly see through uh, what was supposed to have been a roof, but you're getting angles that I guess a normal person wouldn't get. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, did they do any other um, views or anything other than that one? Yeah, so the, the technology is uh, pretty cool. Like, I mean, the scans that allowed them to create the flyover video also allow um, uh, the witness, David Dustin, to um, use his iPad to control the view of this, um, of a certain vantage point within the scan. And um, that's also animated, simulated within the scan. Um, so you can go ahead. Is that from inside the vehicle? From inside the vehicle, from outside the vehicle, from like any vantage point within the scan. Um, he can position it and then move the um, move the iPad around, almost like if the iPad were virtual reality goggles. And okay. as you move around physically, you can see within the scene different mm -hmm. perspectives. And when he, uh, what happens when they uh, do a side view of the car, of Ross Harris's car? What happens? Yeah, what do you what do you what do you see? What what can you see? What did you see on the screen when during your cross examination? Um, so I don't think that I had him do the manipulated like virtual reality during 
during my cross, but they, they definitely did it on direct. Testimony. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to limit it to his to your cross of him. During his testimony, uh, what did you see? Yeah, so like they had, I, I can recall there being big on the Mondo board, um, like a close up inside the car with the door, with the, um, the passenger doors open, like a close up on the car seat and the doll. Um, just, you know, well, just focused open, in on or... that. What's that? Were the doors open or were they removed? Um, either they were open or removed. I mean, I, 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 if, if what I recall is it was, it was focused in beyond the doors. So it was like from a side view inside focused on the child model. and the seat. So it was close up. Yeah. It was, I mean, at different points, but yeah, I mean, I distinctly remember there being a close up. Um, I want to say they were trying to show like how close the car seat was to the front passenger seats or where it was positioned in relation to the front passenger seats, something like that. All right. Did you have, um, was there any device from, to get angles from the front driver's seat? Yeah, so there was also a, uh, as part of the scan, what um, David Dustin did was he put like a tripod inside the driver's seat, he positioned it on driver's seat, and then the head of the scanner, um, it, it moves, it, I guess like swivels, and it, it shoots out these lasers in all directions, um, and the laser bounces back um, and it basically created this panoramic photo, 360 degree photo uh, from inside the car from the driver's seat perspective. All right, now what could that, if anything, could that uh, panoramic view uh, do that a human being couldn't? Well, if you looked at the actual panoramic photo, it was, it gave the impression, well, it was from like the perspective of someone sitting backwards in the driver's seat where you could see, you know, directly behind the, I mean, you could see the headrest of the driver's seat, which obviously if you're sitting in the driver's seat, you can't see the headrest directly behind you. This panoramic photo showed the headrest and it gave the misleading impression, I thought, that no matter, no matter what, you can see the child. You can see the car seat. You can see the model. All right. And um, when they were setting up that monitor and they were testifying before the jury, they talk about how the height and or whatever to, to make the driver uh, panoramic view, the eye angle for it. Yeah, as I recall, um, uh, David Dustin um, set the height of the scanner to be you know, approximately that of his eye level. Of David Dustin's eye level? David Dustin's. Why did they choose David Dustin? Because David Dustin was close in height to Ross Harris. I mean, they wanted to, they, they wanted to simulate the perspective of Ross Harris. They give a, uh, a reason um, for uh, introducing this uh, testimony, or this uh, um, this uh, uh, 3D scan, sorry. Um, I, I think to show spatial proximity between objects in the scene. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. I don't have anything else this time. Can you hear me okay, Mr. Rodriguez? Yes, ma'am, good morning. Good morning. So with regard to cross-examining David Dustin, you had a strategy um, that you employed to go ahead and uh, try and discredit the 3D, um, basically kind of a crime scene diagram, is that right? Um, well, I don't know about discredit it. I mean, it's, 
it, it like I said, it's pretty cool technology. I just don't, it, the way that it was used was, I thought to provide a misleading impression of what actually happened in reality. And did you express that through your cross-examination? I tried to. All right. And with regard to Mr. Persinger, um, I noticed you said that the minute he was putting up some stuff that wasn't in his report, you pivoted right away. Yeah. Try. Okay. And that's happened at trial. People all of a sudden start testifying to stuff you've never heard before, right? It happens. Yeah. And in this case, when you pivoted, I believe you strategically attempted to confront him and discredit him. Is that correct? Yes. I tried to impeach him. All right. And the reason you wanted to impeach him was you wanted to show he was biased by having selected this Griffin Psychology website. Yes. Okay. And you, in fact, did that. You brought that up to his attention and demonstrated that, didn't you, just through cross-examination? Uh, not the way that I intended. Best laid plans of mice and men, right? That's right. All right. And I want to draw your attention to August 10th of 2015. Did you have the occasion to go with Maddox Kilgore and Brian Lumpkin and Dr. Diamond to visit Ross Harris at the Cobb County Jail? I think so. <laughs> okay. This would have been the first time Dr. David Diamond came into Atlanta and he was the first time he met with you and your team and then I think you and your team took him out to the Cobb County Detention Center. Do you remember being there during that interview um, with your client? Yeah, so I'm sorry. What's throwing me off is the August date. Um, I definitely recall the, I definitely recall being with, um, with Mr. Diamond the first time that he came to, uh, to Marietta and Cobb County and we went to the Cobb County Jail to meet with Ross, I remember that. Okay. And that very first time, um, did Mr. Or, I'm sorry, did Dr. Diamond have his laptop with him? Um, I can't recall if he did. Okay. Uh, what did you see or notice in any way that Dr. Diamond took notes regarding his interview with Ross Harris? I don't remember him taking notes. I just remember us talking in the conference room. Talking in the conference room? Mm -hmm. Did he have his laptop open to take notes on the laptop while you all were talking in the conference room? I have no idea. All right, and then I'm gonna pivot now myself to November 3rd, 2016, um, while at trial. And this was the 29th day of testimony. The defense was presenting its um, defense and Dr. Jean Brewer was on the stand. Do you recall Dr. Jean Brewer testifying? Yes. Okay, and who handled that uh, direct examination for the defense? Maddox. All right. And do you recall at a lunch break meeting with Maddox, Mr. Lumpkin, and yourself to discuss whether to put Dr. Diamond on the stand or not? No. You don't recall doing that over lunch? Mm -hmm. Who made the decision about whether to call Dr. Diamond or not to the stand on November 3rd, 2016? Well, I don't know when, I don't know what date it was, but it would have been Maddox's call. He was the lead. And do you recall seeing Dr. Diamond that day waiting to testify on November 3rd, 2016 in the courthouse? I don't. Do you remember meeting with Dr. Diamond at the end of that particular day of testimony? I don't. Do you remember that after Dr. Jean Brewer testified, there was a lunch break that Mr. Kilgore came back into the courtroom and announced that the defense had no more witnesses for that afternoon? I don't recall that. I mean, I'm not saying that that didn't happen. I just, I, I don't, I, I mean, that was a long trial. I don't recall, I don't remember vividly Maddox coming in and saying that we need to break for the day and Dr. Brewer being the last witness of the day. I don't, I just don't remember that. If that's how it went down, I don't dispute it. I mean, I think the transcript probably would, I mean, if you want to direct me to that, I could probably agree with you, but I just don't remember no, no, that's okay. I, I just wanted to know what your recollection was um, and you know, basically kind of how that day went. Um, 
And if I may have one moment. I will pass the witness. Ms. Durham, do you have anything further? Everybody use the microphone but my own. I'm sorry. Um, everybody's microphone but myself. Hey, uh, um, Mr. Rodriguez, I just got a couple of uh, questions. Uh, the state asked you about, um, you know, it's uh, it trials. Sometimes you have to pivot and, and do things uh, with, uh, and when, when Mr. Persinger's regard, he came in with uh, a litany of things that were not on his two, two item checklist. Mm. What would, how did you try to pivot in that? Well, <clears throat> I, I then wanted to um, impeach that expert witness with all of the computer evidence, all the digital evidence that he would have had available to him that would have easily shown that his opinion about uh, Ross being crafty and suspicious and clearing his cash and all, all this stuff, that that was really just a fraud. And given the jury an opportunity, or not, not an opportunity, but given the jury a significantly different impression of his credibility. And you were doing this, uh, you were gonna do this through cross-examination? Absolutely. So uh, um, what were you trying, I mean, without trying to get into these things, but were you doing it to show any uh, anything on the lead investigator's behalf, any uh, anything he was trying to do improperly? Well, yeah, I mean, like, like I said, it was either that he was intentionally uh, misleading the jury about his level of thoroughness or um, he didn't know and he was incompetent and not worthy of belief. I mean, either way, it was a biased investigation and his testimony was completely biased in favor of the state. And you were trying to show that through your cross-examination of him. I, I certainly plan to. And, uh, you, uh, all right. Thank you very much. Nothing further from the state. All right. Thank you all. I think it's a good time, obviously, to take a break for lunch. Let's recess until one o'clock. Um, mm -hmm. What do you need, Mr. Durham? Do you need something? I'm sorry. Sorry? I'm sorry, Judge. I couldn't hear what time we're recessing until. Yeah, until one. One. Right. Thank you. But if you need, well, let me ask this. Mr. Durham, are you? I was, gonna, I was gonna see if I could do 130, but okay. Well, we are, we're about to, rest. we don't have any more witnesses. So um, we will be, unless the state has witnesses, we will be done today. So I was gonna see if we come back at 130. Does the state have uh, witnesses? No, Your Honor, the state has no witnesses. Do you anticipate uh, concluding your argument this afternoon or what is your status, Mr. Durham? Um, what would, uh, I don't know, I don't even know I had choices, so. <laughs> Well, oh, how long is it? Uh, it's, uh, that's just it. That's what I, I mean. I, I'm wanted to whittle it down now and try to make it more uh, concise and a little bit. Um, well, um, regardless, you need time to develop your argument. You're asking me for a little more time. We're on pace. I have no problem with following traditional hours and waiting until 1.30 for you all so you can have a break and be developed and prepared for argument this afternoon, one thirty is fine with me. Thank you. All right, very well. We're in recess until one thirty. Thank you, Judge. Absolutely. Right. Hey, Ross. Hey, Mr. Evans. Hi. Hey, Carlos. What's up? <laughs> All right, let's have recess, everybody.